Sir Garwin and the Green Knight unfolds as a narrative featuring a noble and chivalrous knight, Sir Garwin, whose conduct stands in stark contrast to the social norms prevalent in his milieu. The poem commences with a grand celebration disrupted by the entrance of a green-clad knight mounted on a green horse. This enigmatic figure proposes a perilous game wherein he invites someone to strike him with an axe, pledging to reciprocate the act a year later. While others shrink from the challenge due to fear, Sir Garwin, in a display of exceptional bravery, steps forward to accept, expressing, such a foolish affair is unfitting for a king, so, being first to come forward, it should fall to me. Garwin's willingness to engage in this extraordinary challenge distinguishes him markedly from his contemporaries, setting him apart in his society. The subsequent agreement mandates that Garwin must seek out the Green Knight after a year to fulfill his part of the bargain. Undeterred by the potential consequences, Garwin adheres to his commitment, embarking on a journey marked by uncertainty about his destination and fate. Asserting his determination, Garwin declares, I must set out tomorrow to receive that stroke from the knight in green, and let God be my guide. Garwin's unwavering commitment to honoring his word, despite the inherent risks, underscores his courage, a quality uncommon in his social context. He emphasizes his resolute stance with the statement, Why should I shy away? If fate is kind, or cruel, Man still must try. During Garwin's quest to locate the Green Knight, he becomes a guest in a castle, where he faces the advances of the king's wife. In a departure from social expectations of the time, Garwin resists her seductive attempts. While women in that era were often objectified and expected to yield to men's advances, Garwin's refusal surprises the king's wife, who remarks, If someone were so snotty as to snub your advance, a man like you has the means of his muscles. Garwin's response, What you say holds good, but such heavy-handedness is frowned on in my homeland, accentuates his deviation from social norms regarding the treatment of women. In essence, Sir Garwin emerges as an atypical knight, characterized by actions that distinguish him markedly from his contemporaneous society. His bold acceptance of the Green Knight's challenge, steadfast commitment to his word, and refusal to succumb to the advances of the king's wife collectively render Garwin a compelling character whose conduct challenges the prevailing norms of his time. When examining Middle Ages poetry, Sir Garwin and the Green Knight stands out as a prime example of feudalism. The poem is replete with elements of exchange and communal living, evident both in its narrative structure and the unfolding storyline. Notably, Sir Garwin lacks a stated author, emblematic of the communal emphasis characteristic of feudalism. Where the community holds greater importance than individual identities in a society that devalues singular figures. This theme persists throughout the narrative, emphasizing the community over individualism. An illustrative instance occurs early in the story when the Green Knight challenges Arthur's court. Arthur, initially confronted, is ultimately saved by Garwin who willingly offers himself in place of the king. Garwin's communal allegiance is evident as he wholeheartedly accepts the risk of defending Arthur, emphasizing his commitment with the line, May this melee be mine. This scene portrays Arthur's diminished agency, relying on his community to stand up for him in the face of danger. Communal themes are pervasive, intertwined with the economic aspects of feudalism. 
The story revolves around the exchange of blows, exemplified in the confrontations with the Green Knight. Smaller scale exchanges occur in Bertilak's castle, emphasizing a feudal exchange where goods are given without the use of money, as expressed by Bertilak's wager. What I win in the woods will be yours, and what you gain while I'm gone you will give to me. While Sir Gawain and the Green Knight vividly depicts feudalism in action, there are elements suggesting the evolution of political and economic systems. Despite the prevalent exchange of goods, a reference to money within the poem suggests a nuanced economic landscape. The line beyond what pennies could buy implies the use of money during the poem's composition, indicating a gradual shift away from a purely feudal system. This underscores the idea that political and economic systems undergo constant evolution, incorporating elements from past and future systems, making it challenging to isolate a prevailing system at any given moment. In Sir Gawain and the Green Knight, Gawain showcases his courtly etiquette, defining himself through kinship and emphasizing his virtue derived from being Arthur's nephew. The Gawain poet adds complexity by framing the narrative with Trojan origins, raising questions about Gawain's identity in the context of Britain's cultural and ethnic diversity. The poem challenges the idea of Trojanness as a fixed racial identity, portraying it as symbolic capital used in shaping British community rather than transcending class divisions. The Gawain poet explores the instability of ethnic identity, rejecting a continuous link between medieval and modern national identities. The poem challenges nationalist narratives and looks back at Britain's ethno-historical origins to challenge political assertions of control over the land. Trojanness becomes a discursive community, illustrating the power of ethno-history in shaping collective identity and emphasizing the fluid foundations of any British ethne. The opening of the poem presents chaos in community formation, portraying Britain's ethno-historical origins as unstable Trojan diaspora rapidly fragmenting. The Gawain poet's vision highlights a neo-Trojan ethnicity, fusing class and ancestry against purely ethical bonds in civic communities. The arbitrary relations to Trojanness suggest geographical and temporal heterogeneity, emphasizing the instability of ethnic ties in ethno-history. The Gawain poet weaves a comedic twist into the epic foundations, using the Green Girdle episode to explore the shifting nature of identity, truth, and honor in the courtly world. Gawain's treachery contrasts with the epic deeds of Aeneas and others, emphasizing the complexities of courtly love and the malleability of symbols. The green girdle transforms from a symbol of protection to a signifier of Gawain's perceived fault, satirizing the superficiality of Camelot's chivalric elite. The poem contributes to the larger exploration of courtly ambiguities, where the quest for truth and honor takes unexpected turns. The Gawain poet's narrative critiques the court's dependence on arbitrary symbols and challenges the conventional nature of night courtiers. The intertwining of personal intentions, collective adoption of symbols, and the ethno-historical frame reflects the superficiality inherent in courtly culture.